Alien is an RPG by Free League, published in 2019. It is an officially licensed game based on the Alien franchise, which started with the 1979 sci-fi classic directed by Ridley Scott. The franchise itself has expanded prodigiously over the past 40 years in five primary sequels, a number of versus Predator spin-offs, and countless novels, comic books, and video games. This game, a pen and paper RPG, is based on Free League's Year Zero dice system. If you've ever wondered about what is even canon alien anymore after the continuous onslaught of movies, you're not alone. This book openly embraces five of the six primary alien movies, as well as a video game from 2015. Here are those products on the alien timeline. The book also slips in Easter eggs referring to the novel Alien Echo, Dark Horse comic book series, and an unmade script for Alien 3, among other things. The book actually incorporates even more into its take on the canon. The authors conveniently list these for you in a recommended reading list. Most notably with regard to this book is that they threw out Alien Resurrection and all the Alien vs. Predator movies. I will just tell you up front here, if you want answers to the two big questions that every Alien fan has, which are 1. Where do the Xenos come from? and 2. What are the engineers' connection to them? You're not going to get those answers in this book, especially not to question number one, but virtually every other question you have about the alien universe appears to be answered. One of the great joys of this book is just reading a complete rundown of the alien universe. It's not really that big in terms of the number of factions and planets. You basically have roughly six major players in a humanocentric galaxy. The Three World Empire, the United Americas, the Union of Progressive Peoples, the Independent Core System Colonies, the Interstellar Commerce Commission, and the Megacorps with Weyland yutani at the top. Essentially, it's about 160 years in the future, and Earth has started terraforming exoplanets both for colonization and strip mining. Some of these planets are further away from the heart of human civilization, and the further out they are, the more dangerous they are. In several of these far-flung locations, humans have discovered both evidence of a long-extinct master race that has human DNA, as well as the Xenomorphs, a diabolically hateful and deadly weapon species. When it comes to the game itself, there is something very curious. The Xenomorphs are optional. They are really just presented as one element in the setting that can be used either sparingly or not at all. The only exception is for one-shots, or what the authors call cinematic play, in which you're strongly urged to throw a Xenomorph at the players because that's what they signed up for. But then there's campaign play. So, cinematic mode is presented as a one-session game with pre-generated characters and defined steps up in the narrative tension, meaning to deliver a movie-like experience complete with the Xenomorph reveal and encounter at the end. But campaign play is really where a lot of the book's resources are focused. After all, there's hardly any time in a one-shot to be worried about interstellar intrigue, spaceship upgrades, repairs, and battles. Yes, there are spaceship battles in this game, I'll get to that later. Campaign play is about a crew in their spaceship facing off against mostly human forces. The authors warn GMs not to reveal Xenomorphs early on in a campaign, and if you look at the amount of detail that they put into both spaceship maintenance as well as campaign generating through a vast number of tables, you can easily envision a campaign that only uses Xenomorphs as a backdrop or a sideshow. In its totality, the book is a lot more than Aliens. There are nine archetypes to choose from when creating a character. Colonial Marine, Colonial Marshal, Company Agent, Kid, Medic, Officer, Pilot, Roughneck, and Scientist. Each comes with a key attribute and three key skills that you can beef up a little more at the start, as well as a choice from three talents. The book also suggests a few different personal agendas, appearances, and starting gear for each, or you can come up with your own. The most important parts, mechanically, are where you allocate your points for attributes and skills. The game runs on Free League's Year Zero engine, which means you're dealing with a relatively simple set of rules. At its core, you have four attributes, each with three skills associated with them. These four attributes, as well as the 12 skills, each have a rating. That rating tells you the number of D6s you can roll when checking against it. So for example, if you're trying to hack a computer terminal, you would invoke the ComTech skill, which is associated with wits. That means you take your wits rating and add it to your ComTech skill rating and throw that number of D6s. If even one die comes up a six, then you have succeeded. 
If you come up with more than one six, then you get to spend the extra on so-called stunts for that skill. Stunts are all different depending on which skill you're using. Your dice pool can actually gain or lose dice before your roll depending on environmental factors, special features from equipment or talents, or from a feature that your enemy has, or just the general nature of the situation as deemed by the GM. You can also push a roll once per check or re-roll all non-sixes to try and get more successes at the cost of picking up stress points. Each character also gets to start with one talent. There are three available talents for each career type and they vary wildly in terms of game mechanics. They don't level up like skills, they're just, you either have them or you don't. A player can eventually earn all three talents for their character if they survive enough sessions, but they can also pick up any of 31 general talents. One of the most notable aspects of the Alien RPG, and certainly the biggest expansion to the Year Zero system here, is the use of stress points and panic rolls. So when your character does something like push a roll or encounter something horrifying or go without sleep, they pick up a stress point. For every stress point they have, when they have to make a regular roll, like for example with a skill check, then they add that number of d6s to their roll. These extra dice are the stress dice. So for example, if I'm trying to operate a heavy loader, I'd use my heavy machinery skill. With a strength of 2 and a heavy machinery skill rating of 2, I have 4 dice to throw to try and get a 6. But I also have 4 stress points at the moment, so I get to throw 8 dice except four of them are stress dice. If any of the stress dice come up a six, that counts as a regular success. The idea is that increased stress will give me the added benefit of adrenaline or whatever. But if any of the stress dice come up a one, then I have to roll on the panic table. To do this, you roll 1d6 and add your stress points to the result. The panic table has 10 possibilities, ranging from keeping it together to twitching, all the way to being rendered catatonic. And occasionally you'll pick up one of the six permanent mental traumas. The immediate panic effect can generally be stopped by another character making a successful command check on you or if a full turn passes. There is one huge exception to the whole stress mechanic in this game and that's synthetics. You can actually play as a synthetic either openly or in secret. Synths in this game generally have higher attributes at the start and really never die perhaps unless their head is destroyed. They don't need air, food, water, or sleep, uh, which happen to be resources you're expected to track in the game. And they don't pick up stress points or make panic rolls. The tricky thing here, of course, is being able to hide one's synthetic nature from the other players at the table. Because certainly the jig is up if a synth takes a hit and starts spewing white fluid everywhere. In terms of hostile encounters, maps are broken down into zones rather than any sort of grid. The size of a zone varies depending on the total size of the area, but basically a character can move up to two zones in a single turn. Zones can also have features that affect roles or character health, such as being cluttered, dark, or irradiated, things like that. Initiative is drawn by card, or everyone can roll a d10 and write down that number. Interestingly, there are certain talents and abilities that can empower a PC or an enemy to swap initiatives with another, essentially giving them two turns before the other can act. As far as turn economy goes, you get one fast action and one slow action, or two fast actions. There are two main flavors of attack, both their own skill. You have close combat, falling under strength, and ranged combat, under agility. Let's say that my colonial marine is engaged with a working Joe synth that is running towards me. I'll use a fast action to aim my bolt gun, and that gives me plus two dice, and fire it at the synth. To do that, I roll my ranged combat skill, which is an agility skill. I have a 3 in agility and a 3 in ranged combat, plus the 2 for aiming, which gives me 8 d6s to throw. Uh, the range on my bolt gun is short, so according to the map, the synth is 2 zones away, so we'll deem that medium range, which takes away 1 from my dice pool. The synth is normal sized, so no modification there. I throw 7 d6 and come up with 2 6s, which means I get a hit dealing the weapon's damage rating of 3 on the synth, as well as an extra stunt. I choose from the 5 stunt options available for ranged combat. Since the synth was armed, I choose the disarming stunt, which means it drops its weapon. Like any self-respecting RPG, there are rules for cover, full auto fire, overwatch, grappling, retreat, and things like that. When you run out of hit points, you are in the state of broken and must roll on a d66 critical injuries table. This table ranges from being winded all the way to several shades of instant death. 
Characters will recover HP either by a medical aid skill check from another PC or just by the passage of one turn. Which is to say, you get an automatic point of health after dropping just by lying there for a few minutes. It's not quite as easy if you've sustained a fatal critical injury. And again, there are four types of instant death on the injuries table. I won't get too into the weapons and gear in this book, but I'll note that the creators did an excellent job of depicting them and covering all the basics that have the look and feel of the alien universe. If you're wondering about why everything has a price tag on it, that's a good question. There really isn't a well-established economic engine in this game, so a GM would have to carry a lot of the water in terms of setting up something like that. Likewise, the vehicles are great. You just get a handful here, but they are fully described in the context of the setting and have the few simple stats that you need for driving around recklessly and ramming into things. Or, you know, operating responsibly. Spaceship creation is a surprising feature of this book, wherein the authors guide you through the whole process for selecting a ship's class, core components, and optional modules, and it even extends to ship armaments and repairs because, of course, you can have spaceship battles. Basically, it works like this. Your ship has five crew positions, captain, sensor operator, pilot, gunner, and engineer. When you square off with another ship, you start at extreme range, and within each round, both ships decide in secret what they're going to do by phase. So it starts with the sensor phase, in which the sensor operator has three actions to choose from. When the sensor operators of both or all ships have committed to an action, they reveal them to everyone at the table at the same time and then roll on them. Then it moves to the pilot phase, where there are five actions to choose from. Same thing, where the pilots choose secretly and then reveal and roll. The next phase is gunner, where there are two actions to choose from. And finally, the engineer phase, with four actions available. A ship can take hull damage that depletes its hull points, or component damage that will affect functionality of the ship. There is a D66 table for the minor component damage, and a 2D6 table for major component damage one option of which will lead to complete and immediate destruction. The book presents the following alien species to the dear reader. Engineers, a species of large humanoids who apparently have human DNA and who have not only seeded Earth with our species, but many others. According to the prequels, they played fast and loose with a black, gooey substance that accelerated evolution, not by centuries, but by hours. This gooey stuff was ultimately the demise of the engineers, the xenomorphs. I'm going to get into my biggest gripe about this book right here. The book does a good job of laying out the life cycle of a typical xenomorph, from egg sac to face hugger to chest burster to grown up. And it also does a good job of further dividing those grown ups into three subcategories, each with a different set of signature attacks and range of stats. You've got neomorphs from the prequels. They also hint at abominations, kings, and emperors, but there are no stats for those. Okay, so here's my big complaint. There are hardly any pictures of any aliens at all. By my count, there are 10 distinct xenomorphic species, but you really just see two different kinds illustrated. It bugged me so much that I reached out to the game director, Thomas Harnstam, to ask him about this. He told me that they wanted to preserve the mystery of the creatures and the psychological impact of the unknown for the players. At several different points in the book, the authors emphasize that Alien is a game of rising stress and fear. There is a really great breakdown of what they describe as the three stages of fear, and how achieving the three stages is a fine balancing act for the GM. First you have dread, which is the sense of something bad happening at some point in the future. You can achieve this with players by foreshadowing and leaving hints of violence. Then there is terror, where there is a sense of something bad just about to happen. This is like when you hear the scratching just outside the door or the hissing just on the other side of the vent. Then there is horror. That moment when the danger reveals itself, when the music crescendos in the movie, and the blood starts to splatter. Mechanically, the game is constantly burdening players with stress points, which of course can lead to failed panic rolls, but the authors note that the GMs should give players ample opportunities to reduce those stress points as well, usually in the form of in-game downtime. Then there is the chief complaint that I've seen of this game, which is players already knowing what's coming. They've seen all the movies, they've played the video games, they even have the action figures. The authors address this too. The solution to this problem is to change it up. Just from watching the original Alien film, you can see how this was brilliantly achieved. Try to remember the first time you watched it. The hostile alien was one thing, then it was another, then it was another. It kept changing forms. 
Prometheus attempted to do the same thing, where you ended up with a smorgasbord of new alien forms. And as questionable as the movie was, it did offer the number one tool for GMs trying to keep things fresh for players. That black gooey stuff, known in the canon as Agent A039 whatever. It's basically a mutagen, one created by engineers that creates diabolical new species when combined with existing ones. The authors did not provide any guidance for how to create new alien species or any rollable tables, so you would be forced to do this heavy lifting on your own. I would suggest starting by looking at the source of it all, H.R. Giger's artwork. Then let your imagination go wild, but don't do this. Okay, so here are my thoughts. Cons. Lack of alien illustrations. As discussed earlier, it would have been cool to have one of those dreamy Martin Grip renderings for each of the Xenomorph subtypes. Extravagant layout reduces table usability. Free League is known for having beautiful layouts, thanks largely to Christian Granith. Alien is no exception, and the pretty pages make for a sublime first reading experience. The problem is going back and trying to use the book as a reference, especially at the table. Additionally, there are a number of concepts hinted at earlier in the book, but then fully explained later. Talk about picking up stress points. The solution, of course, is to use the index in the back of the book and to use tabs, or a lot of control F if you're on the PDF. Pros. The stress mechanic is the big add-on to the Year Zero engine here, and it does exactly what it's supposed to do, add psychological tension on top of a physical threat. And it's more than just shooting xenomorphs. I'm not sure how they came to the decision to do this, but when you consider the incredible campaign generator section of the book that goes on for pages and pages of tables, as well as the entire fleshed out mini game of spaceship ownership and space combat and mechanics for hypersleep, you have more than just an aliens versus humans shoot 'em up. This game ends up being a space exploration RPG in its own right. It should almost be called World of Alien, since it manages to tackle so much more than just encounters with xenomorphs. It's really more like a variant of the RPG Traveler, in which you are a crew with a ship pitted against all the wonders and tribulations of a space frontier where the corporations are the true monsters, plus xenomorphs. So there you have it, the Alien RPG by Free League. Thanks to Wendy from the awesome Year Zero Worlds Discord server for helping me find some of the Easter eggs. I'll leave a link to that server below, where you'll find all the discussions and newest news on all Free League products. And as always, thanks for watching. This is Dave signing off. See ya.